Let's pray. And we're going to go into the word of the Lord this morning. Oh, Jesus, we want to thank you for the, just the beautiful presence of the Lord that has been here in the house. And we just want to stay in that presence, that beautiful presence of Jesus today. Oh, Christ, make your words come alive. We didn't say these words. We didn't make these up. These are the words that you spoke to us. And we want to just meditate on them, apply them, and find the life that is in them. When you spoke, your words bring life. When somebody actually follows your words, life is given to them. It flows through them. Joy and peace and, and, and the, the goodness of God. So help us this morning as we go into your word. I am a weak and feeble servant, but your words are strong. Let your words speak to us today. Encourage us. Build us, we pray. By your precious name. Amen. We're doing a series if you're visiting with us today. And if you are visiting, it's awesome to have you with us on call Being Ready. It's kind of to do with, you know, it's just a three-week series. And it's kind of to do with the beginning of the year, 2018. Um, and uh, just kind of getting our minds and hearts ready. But it's a little bit even deeper than that in the sense that it's about having your life ready. Because, you know, these milestones like New Year and birthdays and so on and so forth, the birth of a child, uh, they're all an opportunity to kind of step back a little bit and find out how am I doing, where am I going, am I on target to what I'm looking for? And when Jesus preached, he sometimes would preach about the end times. He would preach about his return. He would preach about the fact that humanity and individuals don't live forever. And in light of that, we should always be kind of ready and thinking about how we're doing so that if our time comes, we're ready for it. Uh, you know, we have family living overseas, as many people here probably do. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you, especially if your parents are getting older, um, you know, you need to, in the back of your mind, you may have experienced this, have a plan in place in case you need to go and leave the country quickly. We had somebody we know quite closely just recently, they planned their trip to go away for the, for the s Christmas to go down to California and then go to New York. It was a great plan and they got to the airport, they bought their ticket and their visa had expired for the United States and they had, couldn't get on the plane. They tried, then it was Christmas so the consulates were all closed down and they lost everything because they, they, didn't, they weren't ready for the trip. And that was a trip that they knew about, not even a trip that was sudden. So when, you, uh, when you've got family overseas or loved ones overseas, you need to be ready, right? You need to. There's a number of things you have to have. Your passport has to be up to date. You have to have some reserve cash uh, so that when you visit your relative, you're not a burden to them. Uh, you know, and you've got to have, if you're going over to a, to a country where it's a uh, um, developing nation, you're probably going to have to have some vaccinations and some things put, uh, you know, done there. When I w first went to Africa many, many years ago, if you didn't have your vaccinations ready, they were waiting at the airport to vaccinate you for you. And this was the day way, way back where they used to reuse the needles. And they had a big smile on their face as they held it up and said, your, your vaccinations are not up to date. So uh, we're going to take care of that. Of course, if you gave a little bit of money, the vaccinations disappeared and you were on your own. So uh, that was the way it used to work. It's changed now. So the, here's, uh, you've got to be ready. You don't know when you're going to be called. You've got to have things in order. And so Jesus, when he spoke about the end times, or he spoke about the, um, the fact that humanity is not eternal, that we, we, we've got a finite time on this earth, he gave some stories, three parables, specifically telling us what he wanted us to be ready in. What were the areas that um, we should be um, in our lives have in order? We think about it in natural terms, uh, in terms of having your finances in order, your will in place, your, uh, you've laid out to people how you'd like your funeral to go, those kinds of things. You have those things in place. But Jesus says, I'm not talking about just natural having things in order, but I'm talking about spiritually having things in order. Now, as I said last week, it could sound like this is going to be a real bummer of a series, but actually it's very exciting because we don't want any of you in this church and any of you even visiting with us today to kind of live a life where you just meander along. One of the things about thinking about the future is that it helps us really focus on what we should be doing today. And so that's why Jesus did this. So last week we looked at one of his parables where he talked about one of the areas that we needed to be ready in. 
And uh, last week he was talking about the fact that we need to be ready in our relationship with God. Our relationship with God needs to be in order. So that when our time comes, whatever happens, and that's something we work on on a daily basis through faith in Jesus Christ. Today I want to have a look at another one. Another story that Jesus gave. It's on the screen, and uh, it's about a story about that we should be living our lives for the king, and we should be living our lives for the kingdom. Now, in um, Matthew chapter 25, uh, he, he gives the story. Is that, uh, there we go. And uh, did I put the scripture in there? I didn't. Matthew chapter 22? I did not put that scripture in. It's, uh, that's uh, okay. We're going to read from the word of God. I'm going to open it up there, and uh, we'll go old school today. Matthew chapter 22. Maybe I, uh, yeah, we'll read it straight out. It's good to just hear the word of God line for line. Matthew chapter, oh, there it is, but it's very small font. Okay, again, it will be like a man. This is the story he told. Another area where he said, okay, as you think about your life, this is an area that I want you to have an order. It's crucial. This area of your life is in order because uh, I'm going to ask you about it when I meet you face to face. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And these bags of gold, by the way, they were worth a lot of money, millions of dollars. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received five bags of gold went at once, put his money to work, and gained five bags more. I would like to know this guy. He is good, right? That's an investment, an investment advisor that you need to know. Um, and now, also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. So he was also very good at this. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who received five bags brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. And the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So these two guys did really, really well. And they took what had been given, entrusted to them, and they multiplied it, and the king was very happy with them. Then the man who received one bag of gold, it seems so unfair, this story, but this is the way things often work. I was just, we were laughing, uh, talking with a member of the church before, and they're, they're going on a trip soon. And a friend of theirs booked the hotel for them, and if their friend is wealthy, and so when their friend back booked the hotel, they suddenly got all these upgrades, and they said the question, well, isn't life so unfair? Why is it the rich get all the free things, and the poor have to kind of like just, like why is it Hollywood stars always get given free gifts where the rest of us have to kind of work hard to get those gifts, right? So life is not always fair. And here's, here's, here's this, this one man only received one bag of gold, and Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown, and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And the master replied, you lay, wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I've not sown and I gather where I've not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers at the very least. So that when I returned, I would have received it back in interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the man who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and there will be an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw this worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that's a pretty tough story. I want you to keep in your head, these are all stories about being ready. Jesus just really being up front with us and saying, hey, this is another area of your life. As you live it, I don't want you to just live it frivolously. I want you to have in your mind some things that you need to have in order. You need to have your faith in order. And this is the second area that he talks about that you need to have in order. Um, you know, maybe just to help understand this story, the simplest way to, to understand this story is just to do a simple illustration and we can get to the crux of it. I have with me a, a genuine 50 Canadian dollar bill. It doesn't smell anymore because it's made of plastic. Right, just like that. So I want to invite somebody to come up. Roland, you're a, you're, you're a godly man. Come on up, you're awesome. 
Come on, don't be shy. I know you're a faithful servant. Come on up. Come and stand with me in front of the lights. So everybody, there's thousands of people watching on live stream right now. You're about to become famous. Come and stand on the light. Okay, here you go. Right, okay. Have you ever seen people do this before? Where they take money, right, like this. It's not a, not a trick. No tricks involved here. This is not a large amount of money. This is all I could afford today, so this is what you're going to get. Um, but they take money, and they give it to somebody, and they say to him, Roland, this is your money. I'm giving it to you. It's a gift to you. But there's one uh, um, clause on this money. You are not allowed to spend that money on yourself. You've got to take that money, and you've got to spend it on somebody else in need. You can invest it, and $50 in the next seven years will be $100. It'll be a long, slow process, but you can invest it. Um, you can um, uh, meet a need. You can give to emissions. You can give to a random stranger. You can multiply, invest it, whatever you want to do, but it's got to increase in terms of making a difference in the world. Okay? That's your money. You can take it. Well, you, you can leave. Go and sit down. Yeah, I'm seriously giving you the money. I am actually, I'm serious. You've just received $50. Give him a hand. He just received 50 back. No, bless you. Hey, man, go have a seat. <laughs> he thought there was a trick. <laughs> There's no trick. He just, he just received 50 bucks. But, you, but he didn't receive 50 bucks because it's not his money. It's, 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 it's. It's got a mandate on it. It's got a commission on it. It's got a purpose on it. So he's not allowed to go and spend it. He could do. And now that's between him and God because he was given something, but he used it for his own needs when it was actually commissioned for something different. And, and people have done this in, before all around the world. And people have gone out with sums of money like that and even more money. And they have come back with stories because they have been free. They don't have to worry about the money. They don't have to calculate it into their budget. They don't spend it on themselves. They're completely free. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's like they, they're, 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 they're just, there's none of the weights of finances there. They're just completely free. This was never my money in the first place. They go out and they do amazing things. And stories have come back about how it's changed lives. Okay, people, young people have gone out and, and helped people in need or have gone out and invested it and brought back more money than what they started with gone on Craigslist and resold and resold and resold or whatever it is and, and then given larger sums to the kingdom because they're free, they don't care. This is what the parable is about. That's exactly, that's it in a summary. We could stop right now. You have been given what you have in your life is not yours. It was given by God. You don't own anything in your life. Nothing in your life, if you're a follower of Christ, belongs to you. It was given from him above for the purpose of increasing the kingdom. That's pretty radical. But that's what the story's about. Taking that 50 bucks, taking your life, and moving out of self-centric to kingdom-centric and being free with everything you own and understand, hey, listen, we've got this to go and make a difference in the world. Uh, a way I could put this, if we were just to summarize uh, what the parable is about, the resources of your life, it's on the screen, the resources of your life are lent to you and have been commissioned to you to use those resources in a way that increases the kingdom of God. This is what the parable, these are the words of Jesus. So be ready because when Christ returns, he's going to ask you to give an account of how you used all the resources in your life. So the second area Jesus tells us to be ready is be ready to give an account for how you have lived with the giftings and resources and blessings that he's poured out upon you. How did you do with the 50 bucks? Did you hide it? Did you put it in your pocket and forget about it? Did you leave here and get so tempted that you spent it accidentally on McDonald's? And, uh, and that happens, right? It always happens when I walk into McDonald's. I always accidentally spend money. And, uh, you know, did you accidentally spend it on something, you know, and, 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 and on your own needs at the moment because you had needs? Right, so it's a, such a challenging parable that you have been... The, the parable is saying, listen, for those who are, us who are in Christ... Everything you have in this life, you will realize has been given to you from God. Therefore, I commission everything that you have 
to be used in a way that increases the kingdom of God. Because when I return, I have to be given account. So I just want to quick look at the three elements of that, what, that statement, or three elements of the parable. The idea that you have been lent, everything that you have in your life has been lent to you. The idea that it has been lent for the purpose of increasing the kingdom of God. And the idea that we will one day have to give an account. I just want to go through those this morning and let the Lord speak to us. This is the heart of the parable that Jesus teaches. At the heart of the parable, all that you have in your life uh, is borrowed and not owned. And what that really requires us to do as human beings to get that um, is there needs to be a little bit of a mental shift, right? Because we are very possessive people. I often think to myself, when, when Jesus returns and we're going to be taken up to meet him, some of us are going to be hanging on to that pair of shoes so tightly that as we get lifted, our hands are going to be on the ground and our feet are going to be on the ear because we're going to be clinging on, right? Our car, we're going to be holding on to our car and then he's trying to take us up and we're going to be holding on to our possessions. Uh, everything we have, um, it's a mental shift. And this is not just something that we get in one day. This is a work that God does in our lives. Over time, he begins to make us realize that everything we have really is from him and that we hold it loosely because he gave it to us for a purpose. I want to just highlight some of the areas that we've been given by God. The first one is time. Time is obviously the most precious resource we have. Time is, uh, is limited. You can't re remake it. You can't reproduce it. Once it's spent, it is gone. It's a very, very, very valuable resource that we have in our lives. And in the Bible, it's really clear that all of us live on borrowed time in the sense that all the time we have on earth has been given us to by the Lord. Uh, anytime somebody goes, we were, we were watching a little program last night about disasters. My kids love watching disaster programs and watching about disasters. And many people who'd gone through, one lady had gone on a car crash on the highway and the, in front of her, a fuel tanker had blown up and her car was engulfed in flames and uh, she managed to get out of it and survive and she, she had video of it. It was very, very traumatic, the whole experience. And everybody who went through these different kinds of things said, I am, I've lived my life so differently now because I have been given another extension of time. I recognize that I could have finished them, but time, time has been given to me. And I think this is the mentality that we have to shift. It's a question we ask. These are questions we ask of ourselves because time, we begin to realize, doesn't go on forever. Hebrews 9 verse 27, there's appointed a time for everybody that we're going to pass from this earth and then give an account for our lives. Luke 12, it talks about a man who kept building, thinking time would go on forever, not realizing that there was a limited time. And so the time we have in this life is, is limited and it's from the Lord. Therefore, he wants us to use our time wisely. And so a question that helps us shift is this question. If you knew you only had a year to live, how would you spend your time? That's a question I think that, that we probably, some derivative of it needs to be floating. We, we need to have long range plans 20, 30, 40 years in advance. I was talking to some folks in the service about people living to 90, still healthy. So even when you retire at 60, you still need to have a 30 year plan because you could be still going at 90. But at the same time, we need to keep eternal perspective and ask the question on a pretty regular basis, if I only had a certain amount of time, what would I do differently? Because by asking that question, you begin to make changes and reprioritize what is important. So that you don't live your whole life thinking that you're going to do something in the future and you have not been allotted the time to do that in the future. You've got to do it in the now, in the present. Um, and I think a lot of people, if they ask that question... There's a number of things that we would do. I think one of the big things people would like to do is rectify relationships. Go and resolve relationships, put out relationships, visit somebody they've not seen in a long time. A lot of people would like to travel and do things they've always done, things that they've been scared to do. I'm going to do it. I like that, right? Just go there and go for it. Many would be emboldened to speak. You, you would be freer to say what's on your heart, Right? And you'd be intentional about investing in things which are going to go on beyond just the here and now. Some people wouldn't. Some people would be like this guy. They would withdraw. They would say, I'm going to binge watch Netflix for a year. And then I'm going to go. It's going to be awesome. But, you know, there's people who, 
who have not experienced the freedom of Christ, who, who would withdraw and have become very self-focused. But the idea that Jesus is telling us, I, I, my, his prayer was that understanding that we have limited time, we would not then try to consume it on self, but we would say, no, I'm going to use it because I want to make a difference. So we need to live our lives with that question hanging around in our heads. Gifts and abilities is another resource that we've been given. Um, your, your skill set, your, 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 your remarkable ability. I often say, if I could choose one artistic gifting, music, whatever, I'd love to be able to, to draw. I'd love to be able to paint. I'd love to be able to be really good at that. Okay, maybe you've got a really good gift. Maybe we could do an exchange. I've got a I've got gift, speaking gift. If you've got a gift of art and you would like to speak, why don't we do a trade, right? Next week, next week I'll be in sitting there and you'll come up. Like we've all, we all got different giftings. We've all got different abilities. Some ability people have great ability with money. And some abilities we have, we have developed over time. We've worked hard to make them successful. We've gone to college. We've done training. We've done success and we're good at it. But here's the question that helps us keep this eternal perspective in our heads. Why did God bless me with this gift and ability? That's an important question. Why did God make you the way you are? And the, 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 the answer we're looking for, obviously, is to do with how can I use this gifting to bless others? God has blessed me with this ability. strong in this ability, whatever it is, or a certain kind of personality. How can I use this? See, the thing is that most people, when they ask the question, why did God give you these abilities? We don't won't admit it, but most of us the answer is to better myself, to improve myself. I've been given these gifts to, to help my family. All kind of uh, egocentric, all about you and your immediate bloodline. But what, what Jesus is saying here is, is, listen, I have given you gifts. I want you to ask the question, Lord Jesus, why did you give me these gifts? Lord Jesus, why did you make me this way? And how do I use that for the extension of your kingdom and the work that you're calling us to do? I love uh, the story of Esther. Remember the story of Esther? Everybody still laughs about it because my sister from New Zealand preached it once and they all thought she was saying Easter. Her name is Esther because uh, her accent was so strong. And Esther was raised up from, she was very beautiful, and she was raised up and identified by the king, and she became the queen of Persia. And uh, she got into a place of great authority, and uh, she was enjoying everything, having a great life. Things were going really well. A spa every day, it was just awesome. And then her people, the Jewish people, were about to be annihilated. Genocide was about to take place. And her advisor, her uncle, came to her, a Jewish man, and said, you need to speak to the king, which is something that the queen was not meant to do. The last queen who did it got her head chopped off, right? So you weren't meant to do it. And he came to her and he said to her, you were appointed for such a time as this. For what purposes has God put you on the earth? He's given you gifts and abilities. And I think it's a question everybody needs to ask, believer or non-believer alike, why were you here? It's not just for your own betterment, surely. Surely there are greater purposes at God, and we need to ask that question and keep asking that question. I imagine if, if we did ask that question, the world would be very different. The people on Wall Street would be very different. I, I, I choose Wall Street because, um, you know, Wall Street is, especially, especially at its worst, is a very self-consuming environment. People are, who are already very wealthy just, just want to get more wealth uh, uh, quickly. Imagine if those in Wall Street were asked the question, because they're very gifted people, uh, why were you put here? Why has God made you this way? The answer surely is not for yourself alone. Surely the answer is partly that you would make a difference. And if the people on Wall Street, I'm just using this as an example, it actually applies to everybody in every area of life, had a shift in mentality, and they saw their reason for being there was to better others, the whole thing would change. A simple question that everybody needs to ask uh, as we look at it. Material resources is another area that we've been given. So we've been given time. Everybody's been given time. Everybody has been given gifts and abilities. Some five bags of gold, some just one bag of gold.
it's good on a regular basis to stop and ask this question. In my finances in 2017, what percentage, we're talking very real practical terms here, what percentage of my finances in 2017 did I give away with no personal benefit in mind, no personal gain, no tick for tat, and not towards my own individual family, which is just an extension of myself? How much of my finances did I give away to people almost unrelated and I'm not going to get anything back from them. This is, this is the, the principle of the kingdom we're talking about here. I, I'll put it into your real life terms. I, don't want to, I, want, I want you to just think this through for yourself, and this is just to challenge you a little bit. Christmas just came and went. And it's a season of giving. Oh yeah. And uh, some of you blessed us, and you've blessed each other, and you've blessed your family. It was just awesome. Hopefully it was for you. But here's a question. What percentage of your giving over Christmas was altruistic? Okay. What percentage of the amount of money? Maybe your Christmas bill was, and it's not unrealistic that people have a $2,000 Christmas bill for the gifts they've given to different people. What percentage of that $2,000 did you give to people or individuals or organizations totally unrelated to you? And I think a lot of people would come with 1%, 2%, I gave, I gave uh, a couple of bucks to the Salvation fo fo Fake Christmas Man at the mall. Uh, I, I gave 20 bucks to uh, some people who knocked on the door. I, I gave some... I, I don't know. And I'm not just challenging you, I'm challenging me. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road because Jesus could ask that question. You could be taken tomorrow. I could be taken tomorrow and say, hey, you know, you say, you say that you, you, you're blessed and I uh, just asked you a real simple question. Over Christmas, how much of it did you give away not to yourself or to your family or to people at the office who also gave you a gift back. That doesn't count. That's, 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 that, that you're doing it for other reasons. You're not doing it just in pure blessing. You're doing it because you're, got, you're going to get things back from it. It's, it's, a, it's a complex relationship that you have to give, and if you don't give the gift, you're going to be in trouble. How much have you given over Christmas? And I think that's probably a, a litmus test of what your giving is like normally. I, the, the, the truth is, they've done studies, the average person only gives away about 3% of their income. That's very generous. That's, that's the average. So there's a whole bunch of people that give way, way less than that. And this is Jesus saying, saying this parable. I want you to get the idea here, guys, that as you live your life, your life is not your own. I gave you the 50 bucks. I gave you everything, and I didn't give it to you for it to be fully, 99% of it to be consumed on you. This is really tough stuff. Are you ready? And as we go into 2018, we need to make a mental shift. Now, I know we don't get there instantly. Some people come up to me and say, Pastor, what's this thing about tithing? And I'm not talking about tithing of money only. I'm talking about tithing of time. I'm talking about tithing, tithing of your gifts and abilities. The idea in the Bible, the word tithe means 10%. And, and, and they say, what's this, what's this idea of tithing in Scripture? Why do they do it? Well, 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 I think God put tithing in place. He said to, said to people, listen, I, as a baseline, I don't want to give you law. I hate law. I want you to be a people of grace. But because as human beings, you kind of change things in your own mind, just to give you a basic understanding of what I'm talking about. Remember he said to the guy, go and put your money in the bank. At least I, that's 10% right there. He said to the guy, why did you bury it in the ground? At least you could have given me 10% back. At least in your lifetime, your giftings and abilities and your time and your finances, at least over a course of a life, at least at a bare minimum, you're going to put 10% back into the world. Not, not for your loved ones, because it doesn't count, ultralistically, for those who you receive no benefit back from. Wow, that's pretty powerful stuff. Challenging for us as we head forward. Are you ready? Because these are the things that we've got to give our account for. I, I, I was reading about this interesting um, concept, a Swedish concept. It doesn't come from Ikea, but it is a Swedish concept. Okay? It sounds like Ikea. It's called Fracta. I've never heard of it before. Fracta. I heard it on the radio yesterday, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is great for my message. So in Swedish culture, you know, the Swedish are minimalists by nature. You know, you go to Ikea, everything is very scaled down. Uh, they are certainly not, uh, uh, you know, Greek with everything scaled up. They are, they are Italian, uh, Swedish, everything's scaled down. And fracta means that as you get older, they actually have a word that means um, cleaning for death. Terrible. 
but they just keep reducing so that when they pass, their children don't have much to deal with. They have cleaned everything out. Because some people, when they pass, they, they have so much stuff, right? I was thinking about this the other day, and I, I'm not trying to hit hard here. I just want to hit hard. Um, I know that sounds ironic, but that's exactly what it was meant to be, okay? And I'm hitting me. I'm not hitting you. I'm hitting me, okay? The person I'm preaching at most this morning is this guy right here, right here, okay? So um, we did, a, we did, a, we did a, uh, a garage sale a few years ago where we were raising money for the new lobby, and people brought different things. And some of you probably said to yourselves when we did that, oh, we were asking you to bring stuff if you got that's of value. And some of you may have said, oh, I've got this, and I've got this I could give, but I'm not sure, da 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 And you didn't do it. That's okay. I, I get that. We're the same, okay? Three years later, four years later, that thing is still sitting there, and you haven't used it anything. Anybody know what I'm talking about right here? There's a resource that will sit in your garage for the rest of your lifetime, and then your kids will take it and sell it for two bucks on Craigslist, whereas that thing could have been sold now or given away now and could have reaped benefits in people's lives. Can I hear an amen to that? That's tough, right? But we've got to become a people who don't just think about... This, is, this message hits to the core of us in Vancouver because we are a self-consuming people in Vancouver and we are to be an eternal people in Vancouver, a people who see beyond this and... And this is not just a message in the church. You'll hear this message even in the world now because people have really got on to this, that there's more to life than us. And this is what Jesus is talking about in this thing. Now, for Christians going through this thing, our focus, of course, is not just on general giving, but specifically giving to the kingdom of God. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. I love this phrase, you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. I mean, the whole core of the Christian faith, if you don't know the Christian faith, is this is how much God loves you. He took his most precious possession, his own son, Jesus Christ, had him come in the form of a human, live, be um, betrayed, be tortured, and be crucified in excruciating death upon a cross so that through his death, a righteous death, nobody's righteous, he's the only one that's righteous, through his righteous death, you might receive forgiveness for sins. You have been bought with a price. What is the price? What, it's not a $50 bill you've been given. It's the most precious thing in, in eternity that's been given, the life of Jesus Christ. You've been bought with a price. You are not your own. Your bodies now belong to the Lord. Your life belongs to the Lord. And so we're called to reinvest this life into the kingdom of God. Now, if the kingdom of God, and I haven't got time, is so diverse as to what that means. After this parable, he gives another parable, and he talks about people who, and when they come before his throne, he says to them, why didn't you feed the poor? Why didn't you visit those in prison? Why didn't you go to the needy? So the kingdom of God is giving to people without evangelism. It's just giving and blessing people. That's part of the kingdom of God. But what we know, if you've, ever, if you've never experienced it before, what I know and everybody here in this room knows, the most significant thing you can give a person is freedom in Jesus. When a person receives the life of Christ coming into them, it is the most radical, life-changing thing ever. In a few moments, we're going to invite those who've never done that before to pray a prayer and, and put their trust in Jesus Christ. And if you do that, it is the most significant thing you will ever do in your life. Ever. 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 Because you are inviting the Almighty God to come and dwell in you, and your life is radically changed. So if I'm talking about investing in the kingdom, I want to invest in that primarily because when people hear the gospel over food and anything else, it brings the most fundamental change in a person's life. But the kingdom of God is, 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 is even more than that. He talked about giving to needs and helping people. So as believers in Jesus Christ, we are called to, to really be aware of our finances and our giftings, that they belong to the Lord, and then really be wise in investing them in the kingdom and in good works and blessing others. I'm just preaching what Jesus preached. Finally, he's going to come and judge us and test us. And when God returns and we stand before the throne of God, it's not going to be an accounting sheet. You did this, you did this. Okay, that adds up to 10%. Well done, good and faithful servant. You had 10%. It's not going to be like that at all. The giving of the gifts, when he judges us, he's looking at our heart. Where was our heart? Because where you put your money 
and your time and your effort reveals where your heart is. So the giving is a revelation of our hearts with God. Mike Ferguson and I uh, recently, uh, when the weather was a little bit of it, he takes me out on Friday. We go out together and we play golf. And Mike's not here this morning, so I absolutely slaughter him every single time. Um, and we play golf. And we're just awesome. We are pros. People always ask us, can we have your autograph? It's just, just amazing what goes on there. Anyhow, one time we went out recently and... Um, uh, we, the two of us, and so the, 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 the guy who's in charge of the course says, hey, this and this is person, could they join you? We said, great. And it was an elderly lady. She was probably in her 80s, and she played golf. And it made the game a little bit longer because normally the ball only went like 30 feet, and then we had to go again 30 feet, whereas, you know, me and, and, and Mike were hitting 400 yards and 500 yards. So it just made the game just a little bit slower, right, as, as we waited. So we went around with her, and we had a really good time. She was a widow. Um, for a few years and uh, just came out and we just, we, just, we just plotted around the course and had a great time. But what happened is that every time we stopped and went to tee off, she would start rummaging through the trash can at the tee off area. It was very embarrassing. This little 80 year old lady was rummaging through the bins. I, I, I was, what's going on here? And Mike, being the shy man that he is, said to her, um, you know, uh, what's going on? and she was taking out anything that could be recycled. And she was putting it into a bag. And he said, oh, what's going on? And she said, oh, no, I, I do this every time I come out, everywhere I go, uh, this is bag. Uh, I collect the bottles and everything because then I take them in and get the money and I give it to cancer research because my family has been affected by cancer. And that really struck me. Here she is playing golf, and at the same time, she's thinking, consumed, with raising money for the cause. Why? Because it's a passion for her. No one told her to do it. It wasn't a thing, give 10%. You don't tell people this. It's in the heart. She just wanted to raise money because she wants to bless people in cancer research. This is what Jesus is going to do when he judges us. He's not looking for 10%. He's looking for the heart. It's just going to reveal where were you at. You were about you. Your life was about you. And that, that doesn't mean that we lose faith. It just means that there's going to be, it's going to be weighty. It's going to be heavy. It's going to be unnerving to stand before the King of Kings, having known that he paid the greatest price of all, which is to give his life for you and me, and 99% of our life was spent on us. So Jesus said, I want you to be ready. I want, you to, I want you to think about this area of your lives. All of us, 2018. You need to think about it. Because it reveals where our heart is. And where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. That's what Jesus said. I love that lady. She really, really ministered to us, really challenged us. This doesn't mean just financially, it means everything. Okay? We have a number of people in our church, I invite the worship team to come. We have a number of people in our church who um, uh, have really caught this. In fact, many of you have caught this, by the way. And this is an area we're all growing in. This is not for condemnation. This is something that, as we head 2018, let's just time to check where we're at and, and, and realign and, and keep the vision clear for our lives. And don't put it off till tomorrow thinking that I need to invest. No, no, do it today because nobody knows the time. Start it now. Start giving now. Start blessing now. Start helping others out now. Start giving up some time to go and do whatever you need to do to help somebody now, particularly for the kingdom. Um, we have a lady in our church. I won't mention her name, but you'll, many of you will know who, exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, who... Um, she, she has, her eyesight is very poor at times and she has a lot of other ailments, physical ailments that she really perseveres through. She, she's not wealthy, lives on a very small budget. But one thing I love about this lady is that any time her health is good enough, she is here at church on a Sunday and goes into the nursery to minister in the nursery program. I, I just think that's amazing. Jesus, remember Jesus talked about the widow? It wasn't about the amount. It was about the heart. Remember that? He said, listen, this lady's given more because her passion is for the kingdom. 
She's understood what God... That's what we're on a journey about. The more we understand, if, if we struggle to give, to, listen, just we're going to come for, for those who are in Christ and we're just going to repent today. It's not about the giving, it's about the heart. Oh, I, I, I'm still not there because I still haven't fully understood how much he has done for me. Because when we understand what he's done for us, we, we just do it. But when we're self-focused, we don't get that, we hold, right? 2018, God wants to release us. 50 bucks, he wants to release us. He wants us to become a people who more and more, our lives don't count just for ourselves, but they count for others as well. Can I hear an amen to that this morning?